Hi, I'm Jess Morrison. I'm the founder of Helux Technologies, and I'm going to talk to you about the future of lighting. For millions of years, only one true reliable form of illumination actually existed, light originating from stars. Direct or indirect, um, stars were the primary source of light for everything on this planet. The stars were not only the birthplace of our physical bodies and where everything that we are made of came from, but also of our imagination and wonder and our understanding. H.G. Wells said during the time machine and the time machine that looking at these stars suddenly dwarfed my own troubles and the gravities of terrestrial life. So the night sky actually invoked creativity and wonder and provided an escape for some people. And I can testify to this. I am the only person in my immediate family with more degrees than mugshots. <laughs> I have a PhD in physics and zero mugshots. <laughs> but the reason that I was able to move from a house that was riddled in poverty and drugs was because I could remember looking up and stargazing as a child in my backyard where I could see the Milky Way galaxy. And I studied physics and astronomy based on this memory. It was a way to escape. But I wasn't the first one. The sky is actually the, um, it's the origin of human exploration. It's the backbone of our calendar and inspiration for the meaning of life, basically, as we know it. And astronomy marked the beginning, the middle, and the end of the scientific revolution. So Copernicus, Galileo, Isaac Newton, they paved the way and enabled the industrial revolution and built the, the crux and the baseline of all of the technology that we know today and all of the uh, advancements that we've gotten to. And the catalyst for the technological growth was the invention of the light bulb. Between the light bulb and distributed energy, we would not be here today. We in improved our productivity and we added hours to our day. Because of that, we had an exponential growth in technological advancement and we largely ignore now the natural rhythm of our bodies and how freeing that is to live sort of at your own schedule. It's something that just recently happened over the last 100 years. We can see the fruits of our labor from space. How ironic that is, because we have no idea exactly what it's doing to ourselves and to our planet. And so while we can see this global development, it's also providing an ominous glow and making it impossible to see in the other direction and to be inspired from the same light that we lived on from the birth of our species. And not just that. Lighting is actually a huge drain now on our electrical system. Um, in, con like in homes, it's actually 9%. And consumer, uh, or in, uh, um, basically in the commercial sector, it's 11%, and granted that's dropping because of LEDs, but I think that the problem is deeper than that. It's, it's not just uh, something that we can fix by dropping the um, power consumption of the light itself. We have to change the way that we use it entirely. And so we've diminished our concern with wasting light because we've made it so cheap and easy um, to power our lights. With the migration of the human population, as was said earlier, into urban areas, we're sort of subjecting ourselves to this unnatural living standard that we don't understand it's, what it's doing to us. And we're now just beginning to understand the difference and the health implications of all of this light being dosed to our system. And we're relearning effectively what evolutionary scientists have known for decades, that we can't dose ourselves with this much radiation in any form and expect nothing to happen. And every living organism on the Earth's surface is, has evolved to this natural 24-hour rhythm in some form or another, and we're largely ignoring it. I think it's ironic that in 2014, the LED prize in physics was based on the invention of the LED, and three years later, three new individuals in physiology were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for understanding the mechanism uh, for circadian rhythm. And the thing is, we can pinpoint that mechanism that drives alertness, and it's affecting our hormone levels, and those hormone levels regulate body temperature. They modulate uh, stress response, sleep quality, and you could go on and on. We honestly don't even understand exactly what we're doing to ourselves. 
And to make finding that ideal solution even harder, you and I literally see everything differently. Not just the brightness, but the color. Everything that you see is just a little bit different than what I see. And the elderly actually require five times more light to see the same, same pieces of paper that a 10-year-old sees. And if you think about the multi-generations that are working in the same workplaces, that's hazardous. I mean, it's got to be, you can't turn the lights up bright enough uh, for the people that are about to retire without hurting those, at the, those that are younger and vice versa. We can see the same impacts on agriculture, as you can see here on the bottom left. It's actually changing, these lights are actually changing the development timeline for crops along highways. And this is miles and miles of highways that are no longer able to be harvested in the way that they're supposed to be. Um, the tree on the top right here is affected because the street lamp is changing its hibernation cycle. And it will die sooner than a tree that's able to go into hibernation in the wintertime like it's supposed to. We have these enormous impacts on the environment and ourselves in ways that we can't possibly understand. So what if we can imagine a world where every single light could be tailored to precisely fit its need? And what if we could move the light around in a way so that we don't end up with those crops dying on the side of the road for no reason other than we didn't feel like putting in the proper lights? And what if this adjustment were automatic and it could detect the environment that it's in and fix the lights? You know, you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not lighting in office spaces was good for uh, the newly graduated, minted, you know, software development, or the person who's been working in this industry for 50 years. We can make tunable lighting include color and brightness and position. I know this because I demonstrated it uh, as a graduate student, and it's now what I'm working on at Helux. We have effectively gotten rid of all of the mechanical structures in a light fixture, and it can do exactly what this demonstration is showing and provide real-time, uh, quick response with a microcontroller of the illumination source. Of course, um, this is pretty rudimentary, and it looks very simple, but imagine if you're sitting at your desk and it can illuminate a notebook differently than your monitor, and how much of an impact that would have just on your posture and your eyes and your strain by five o'clock when you're ready to go home. I believe that office and living spaces are now being built with human-centric design and we're already in that direction. We have a heightened sense of our environment and lighting's impact on it um, and, and ourselves. And so if we marry this drive toward uh, health with a momentum of sustainability, we can reimagine our relationship with light as we know it. And if we're persistent, our children will look up and see the inspiration that most of us miss completely. And they will be able to use it to better the lives of every generation to follow. In the words of Alfred Lord Tennyson, it is not too late to seek a newer world. We don't even notice anymore that we can't see what the birth of science was based on, but I believe we can get it back. Thank you.